I often get asked, how do I take photos when I'm walking around the city? Like, where do I even start? And honestly, the answer is not as complicated as you think. In fact, it's more of a science and not an art. So in this video, I will show you the whole process. This video is also sponsored by Squarespace, but more on them later. The first thing I need to decide is the purpose. Why am I going out to shoot? Am I going out alone and focusing on my craft to become a better photographer? Am I going to explore a new part of town? Or am I going to meet a friend and shoot together? Because the reason for me going out will determine many other decisions that I make going forward. I also have a think about what is the goal for the day? What's the aim? Because if the end goal is to just enjoy myself rather than work on becoming a better photographer, then I would probably pick a different lens and even a different location and a different route. Once I know why I'm going out, the next thing is to plan a route and select a location. Also, this will depend on time of year, time of day, the weather conditions. All of that plays a huge role. For example, in the winter in London, I would always walk from east around Shoreditch to west. Because by doing that, I am walking with the sun, especially if I stand on the north side of the river. Therefore, I get good ample lighting throughout my entire walk. More on lighting in a minute. It will make sense why I choose this route. If I want to shoot at night, I'll pick Soho over Covent Garden, for example. If I want to shoot, you know, busy, like packed scenes, I might go to Chinatown. If I want to shoot, I don't know, clear, minimal compositions, I might pick Canary Wharf or Bank. So although it might seem like I would just go out and randomly walk around, there is a bit more thought that goes into it. Now that I know where I'm going, why I'm going, and the potential conditions I might encounter, I can have a think about, okay, what gear do I wanna bring? Do I wanna bring a prime lens, a zoom lens, or do I even just wanna bring my phone and leave the camera at home? It has happened now and again. So personally, I would either go out with two primes, one prime, or a zoom lens. If I'm just going out, and I'm with my mates and I don't care about photography and I just, you know, if I see something, I'll take it. I might bring the 18mm f1.4, so that's like a 27-ish mil full frame. I tend to crop that to 35mm anyway. Um, and the reason I would bring it is because it's fantastic for documenting whatever's happening that day. If I'm going out and I think, you know what, I might do some more street photography, I might bring the 33mm, so the 50mm full frame lens, because that's typically the focal length I use for that. If I'm going out alone and all I want to do is focus on photography, I would probably bring both of the primes. And if I'm going out and I don't know what I would encounter, or maybe I'm going out and it's going to be heavy rain, or maybe I'm going to be covering different areas that require a different focal length, then I'll just bring the zoom. Because you see, sometimes a certain area where you have like very tight, narrow streets, a wider lens might be better. Equally, if you go somewhere that's very open, maybe a tighter lens would be better. So by knowing why I'm going out and where I'm going, I can then make a more informed lens decision so that I don't have to go out with 20 lenses in my bag, just in case. Now we can get into the meat of the video and let's start with light. Light, to me, is the most important part of photography. Some may disagree with this, but at the end of the day, photography is capturing light. You can have the most mundane, the most boring subject, but if it's lit well, it will look very interesting. Equally, you can have the most mesmerizing, the most interesting subject, but if the light is absolutely dead, it's gonna look boring. So light is important. Now for my style of photography, I typically look for two sources of light. The first one is backlighting, where the light is behind the subject. And the second one is side lighting, where this light is coming from the side of the subject. I sometimes might look at 45 degrees or flat light, but generally most of my photography is side lit or backlit. The reason for it is because in my opinion, it creates the most cinematic, and the most dynamic image possible. Our cameras don't see the world in 3D, we do. So we can tell you know, the depth of an image, of a scene, sorry, just by with our eyes without having the right light. However, a camera is a flat 2D sensor. It needs lighting, it needs the correct shading, a bit like when you draw. 
to you know to make sure that it looks like it's a 3D scene. Another example is if you look at movies, very cinematic movies, you know, Joker, all those kinds of um, films. If you actually pay attention to the most beautifully filmed scenes, I would say 80, 90% of them, the lighting is either from behind or from the side of the subject. So now going back to the route planning section, where I said that I'll be going on the north side of the river with the light. Well, at all times, the light is 90 degrees to the way that I'm walking, which means every street corner will have amazing side light and I can simply just turn into the light and shoot into the light that way. If I didn't plan my route and my lighting around the time of year, I could just be walking in shade like if I went on the south side of the river for the whole day and then just I won't really get anything interesting. With lighting out of the way, the next thing I look at is composition. Now, composition is a very in-depth and somewhat complicated topic. Everyone has their own kind of take on it. I have done a very in-depth video about it. I'll link it down below. Also, I did an in-depth video about lighting, which I'll link down below. For the purpose of this video, I'm just gonna try and simplify it down a little bit. So, to me, a good composition is also a well-balanced image. Now, you can get, let's say, leading lines, framing, um, foreground elements, things like that. And they don't make a bad composition good. They will make a good composition even better. What makes a composition good is, as I've said, balance. So what do I mean by balance? I mean, when you look at a photo, your eyes are not rolling off to the side. Your eyes are not rolling off to the bottom. The image doesn't feel like it's about to fall to the left hand side. And how do you achieve that? Well, you have to balance out all the different elements within the scene. So what elements would you typically have to deal with? So first of all, you have your highlights and your bright colors. They are very prominent. You then have your negative space and your details, somewhat less prominent. And finally, you have, you know, just general boring shadow detail and shadow area, even less prominent. Now, each of these commands its own weight. Now, weight as in not kilograms, weight as in your attention. The more attention it takes, the quicker it takes that attention. You could argue the heavier that item is. So in order to balance out a scene where you have a very bright highlight and a shadow area, you could argue you would need a larger shadow area to balance out a smaller, brighter, more vibrant source of light. In the most simple terms, that's how I compose my images. I would look at the scene and I'd be like, okay, there's a very bright sky and the sun in the corner there. I would need a much larger shadow or detail or negative space area at the bottom of the image on the opposite side to balance it out so that you're not just looking at the sun. So you're looking at the sky and then moving your way down through the image. So the next time you're composing a photo, just step back and just think, okay, does this feel normal? Does the image feel like it's about to fall to the left or to the right? Unfortunately, it's not something that you will learn just by watching this video. It's not something that you will learn from any book or any photography course. It's something that will just come naturally to you as you spend more time doing photography. Every time you look at composition, just literally have a think, how does this feel? Does this feel off? If it does, it probably is. And then try to change the composition a little bit. And yeah, sure, leading lines, framing, foreground elements, they will make your composition even better. But just don't rely on them to make a composition, you know, don't rely on them, sorry, to make a crap composition a good composition. They will simply make a good composition better. At this point, I would like to thank the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace is my main portfolio where people come to see my best work. I have full control of how my work is presented and interacted with. Squarespace is also the hub for my business, my newsletter, and my travel photography blog. Finally, I use Squarespace as my social media landing page and my digital business card. Whether you're a beginner or a pro, having your own website is never a bad idea. So if this is something that interests you, click the link below to get a free trial followed by 10% off your first purchase. Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring and thank you for watching. With lighting and composition out of the way, now let's talk about the most subjective and even divisive part of the video, and that is what constitutes a good subject. Now, I'll be honest with you, I can't answer that question for you. I can't even guide you on that because at the end of the day, 
A good subject is what you find interesting. If you're walking down the street, whatever catches your eye, that's a good subject. Now, what catches your eye today might not be the same thing that will catch your eye in two years' time because obviously you will develop and then you will look at other things, maybe more complicated things to shoot. But at the end of the day, a good subject is simply something that you find interesting. And obviously that will change depending on location, time of year, or even time of day. If you're in London, you might find red buses interesting. But if you've lived in London for 20 years, you might think they're boring as fuck. Equally, you might be in, let's say, um, the Mediterranean where I was, and I was loving all of the little windows and the window frames and all that kind of stuff. Whereas someone who's lived there might think, what on earth are you taking pictures of? So at the end of the day, when it comes to subjects, just walk around and just shoot what you're interested in. Let yourself be guided by your gut feeling. And then that will develop and that will mature over time. Oh, and one last thing on the topic of subjects. When you're taking photos of things that you like, just remember you're taking them because you like them. The reason I say that is because the moment you start sharing your work online, there's always this group of very insecure photographers who would walk around and tell other people what they think their photography is and isn't, okay? And you will definitely come across that where someone will message you and then be like, you can't take a photo of a window blind because that's not street photography, doesn't have any people in it, right? Just all of that is a noise. You don't need it, ignore it, and just take photos of what you like. So one thing I wanna say before going into this in more detail, not every image needs to have a story. Some images just need to be visually pleasing or simple. Because you see, when you have, let's say, 10 photos from your trip, and every photo is this masterpiece that tells the most incredible story, and you put it into a sequence, it might all just get lost amongst each other. Whereas if you have a few just very nice, visually pleasing images to kind of break them up, it makes for a better photo set, which is actually the next topic, but I've jumped. I'll come back to it. So story, in my personal opinion, an image with a story makes you feel a certain way about that particular image, or it brings back a memory, or it makes you wonder what it's like to be in that particular scene. If we look at this photo, which is of a sunset in London, specifically around September time, Canary Wharf Peel get amazing sunsets. Now, I could have easily just taken a standard photo, of, or a standard cityscape photo of this scene. However, in this particular image, you have the guy sitting there chilling out smoking with the sunset and the city behind him. And the reason this image has a bit of a story, in my opinion, is because it makes you feel like you could be there. It makes you feel like you're sitting down, you're looking around, you're people watching, and you see all of these people chilling out, relaxing, and enjoying the sunset. Whereas if it was literally just a cityscape, it would be just a cityscape. Another example of an image with a story is an image that makes you ask questions. So have a look at this photo of the girl in the subway in New York from a couple of years ago. And in this particular photo, as a viewer, I'm asking, is she hiding from someone? Who is the girl on the train that's staring at the photographer or at the girl? Is someone coming to get her? What's going on? And because obviously the image is quite dynamic with the motion blur of the train, it all kind of feels like a still from a movie. And because I've been asking these questions as I've looked through this image, um, it gives it a bit of a story, in my opinion. Okay, we're now onto the final part of my process, and that is to focus on and look for photo sets from a particular day out or a particular location, and not just going for these five-star storytelling incredible photos. And don't get me wrong, they still belong in the photo set, they can be the leading image, but there's also other images within the photo set that together, in my opinion, will make for a better story of where you were and what was happening. So typically in a photo set, I would go for three types of images. The first one is an establishing shot, typically wider angle, and it tells you, the viewer, where I am. You know, am I in a city? Am I in the countryside? Am I in New York, in London? Just to give you a rough idea, okay? It establishes what's happening. And then you have the subject. That could be a person, that could be a vehicle, it could be a building, it could be anything which is of interest and everything kind of revolves around that subject. 
Finally, it's a small insignificant detail on its own. You might think, what on earth is that? But when you put it together in this photo set, it just effectively makes you look at the little details of the scene and breaks everything up as well. Now, you could have three images, five, six, ten, it doesn't really matter how many images you have in the photo set, but as long as it's a concise and tight set with all of these different angles covered, you will have a very strong body of work, which as I've said, in my opinion, is stronger than just having one image on its own. Okay, that's everything for today. Let's do a very quick recap. So first of all, I always ask myself, why am I going out? What's the purpose of me going out? I then look at location, time of day, weather conditions. After that, I look at what gear do I bring in order to make that location and my intentions work. After that, I look for lighting, then composition, then find an interesting subject, see if I can tell a story about the subject given the context. And finally, I put together a photo set of all of my images from that day out. And that is my entire photography process. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you've taken something away from it. If you're still here, thank you very much for your time. If you do have any questions, please write them down below. But I also have a question for you. Do you have some kind of a process when you go out, you know, or is it just a case of you walk around and see what you can find? If you do have a process, write it down below. It'll be interesting to hear how you go about photography. Um, and that's it. So again, thank you so much for watching. Have a good day and I'll catch you in the next video. Bye.